Good morning, everybody. How are you? How are you? Happy Sunday. Are you excited to be here? Yeah, let's all stand. We love to read scripture here together at Refuge. If this is your first time, by the way, welcome online. Hey, would you guys turn to the camera? You see that one right there? And just wave at everybody that's online. Give them some love. Hi, guys. Hey. Uh, we love reading scripture here. And so if you're at home, we are going to be in Romans 15, 13. But would you guys look at this card that you got when you walked in? I'm going to read this once by myself. And let's read it together the second time. But it says, Now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. I'm hearing a couple hopes in there, which is exciting. Let's read this together. Ready? Now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Isn't that sweet? We believe in a God that gives us hope, gives us joy. What else does he give? Let me hear something. Peace. What's up? Love. Mercy. Wisdom. Grace. All these amazing things that God gives and provides. Uh, we don't have to have any of that on our own. The Lord, the Lord does it all. And this morning, he's going to do it all. Uh, we have an amazing worship team with us this morning, and I'll introduce them once we wrap in prayer. But let's pray real quick. Let's bow our heads. Lord, I thank you that you provide exactly what we're needing this morning. God, I thank you that uh, no matter the week that we've had or maybe we're looking ahead at the week and we're feeling a little stressed, God, you got this. You got us. We can fall back on you. And so, God, we give you this time. This is a time to recharge, Lord. This is a time for us to be filled with your spirit so that we can go out into this world, Lord, and love on our neighbors. Give them that joy, that hope, that wisdom, Lord, everything that you provide. God, all good things come from you, and so we just want to give you that honor, God. This moment, this morning is all about you, Jesus. So we love you. We're excited to see what you want to do. We pray these things in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen. Hey, this morning we have intercede worship. Now, they used to be from School of Worship, and now they kind of started this ministry where they just want to go to churches and give worship leaders like me some time off, which is really nice. <laughs> I get to be out here worshiping with you guys. So would you guys welcome them? Give them a big refuge welcome. Yeah. Hey, good morning, church. Good morning. Thank you guys so much for having us. It's an honor and privilege to be worshiping with you guys. I just want to invite you, as we get to worship the Lord, may we approach the throne of grace boldly. He tells us to approach it boldly, even though we might feel like we're sinners, we might feel like we, we're so messed up, Lord. He cleans us in this time as we get to encounter Him. So may we have open hearts, may we have willing hearts to open to Him and to give Him the worship that He deserves, to give Him the praise that He deserves. So as we sing this, let's give it all to Him. Come on, church, we sing, Father, we have come. Father, we have come to bow down in worship, lifting up our hearts, we bow down in praise. Let's sing hallelujah. Come on. In Shining like the sun 
here for you, Lord. Lifting up our hearts, we bow down in praise. Amen.
darkest day in history They're on a cross they made for sinners For every curse your blood atoned One final breath and it was finished But not the
is Lord. He's the living God. We praise you, Lord. We give you the honor, the power, the blessings. You deserve everything, Lord. May our lives be obedient to you, God. May we offer our bodies as a holy living sacrifice to you. I pray that as we continue, Lord, through this service, God, as the message is spoken, Lord. Holy Spirit, I pray that you would touch the hearts of your children, God. That they would come to know you more and more and more. That you'd reveal more of who you are to them. And that they would live in a life of obedience, a life of worship to you, God. We thank you, Lord. We love you. We love you, Father. We love you, Son. We love you, Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Give him some worship, church. Come on, he's worthy. Amen, amen. Thank you so much, Intercede Worship Team. We're so glad to have had you here today. You guys can have a seat. Welcome. How are you guys doing? You're doing great. It's so good to see you. Uh, welcome to Sunday morning. If you are new or newish, as I like to say, um, we're so glad to have you here. My name is Katie, and we're just take, take a quick pause to tell you about a few things going on here at Refuge before we continue with our service. Um, if you don't know, we have two main teaching pastors here at Refuge, Pastor Bill and Pastor Jeff, and Pastor Jeff will be speaking today and continuing in our, serv- our series in the Book of Acts. Um, but first things first, how many of us already know what we're doing this afternoon and evening because we're all excited about going to the beach together? Yes. Oh, that sounds like a lot of you. Yes? Well, let's just, let's just see around the room. Hands. Hand. Okay. Maybe more people are excited about the idea of it than actually coming. I know what it is. I know why. Because I, too, have been affected by watching Shark Week. Now, let's just talk about it. I was like, why is this happened to be this very week. But if you're like me, as I watched Shark Week, I thought, okay, all these episodes are not taking place here. So I think we're clear. We're clear. Um, I do have some travel advisories for North Carolina and South Africa. But anyway, um, tonight is our second of three beach nights. Um, It's Beach Boulevard, where it dead ends into PCH, Tower 17. So if you haven't joined us before, or not hard to find, we'll have flags. Um, We'll have hot dogs, bring a side dish to enjoy for yourself and maybe others around you, and also s'mores, so that'll be a great time. But the main thing we're super extra excited about tonight, in addition to the the chance for fellowship and um, message and worship time, is baptisms. And yes, so last week, um, how many of you have been to our prayer room? Our prayer room is to my right, to your left, right inside this door. It's available after every service for those of you who want communion. But that's where we typically have our baptism class because it's small, it's intimate, we get to know people. Well, I peeked into that classroom um, last week and we had to keep pulling chairs. I thought it was going to be a fire hazard. And from the sanctuary into that room, there were over 30 people in that room. Yeah, praise God for that. So that means we have people getting baptized, um, over 30 people, um, kids, all the way up to someone who is 81 years young. So that's really awesome. Yeah, yeah. So if you're still on the fence, let me just encourage you. This is a fantastic time for us to come together to celebrate. When I see people getting baptized, I hope you're like me, you just get a huge faith boost and so encouraged to celebrate what God has done in someone's life. So I encourage you to come out for that. Um, And if you miss the directions or need more info, come talk to us or see the information online at our website. That's where they're not, not just anywhere online, but specifically at our website. Okay. Oh, and also just to note, you know, it's the U.S. Open of surfing. So don't let that deter you. Just come early, especially if you're getting baptized. You'll be fine. Okay. Next thing. Um, really, really excited about this event. How many of you have seen that movie, you know, the Jim Caviezel one? Tell me the name. Sound of Freedom. Thank you. I have two. Maybe you're really impacted. Well, here's a fantastic opportunity to do something, to take the next step. And that is with, I'm partnering with um, a ministry that's been operating here at Refuge, um, Beacon for Victims. And so August 11th, it's a Friday night. This is going to be a cool, cool opportunity to hear more, hear more of this story, hear from an actual survivor 
an actual survivor. So let's come and encourage her, show her mom how much we appreciate her. Her name is April. And then there's going to be a hands-on activity where there's something that you can do that the ministry will then take to those who are potentially caught up in human trafficking. So you're going to listen, learn, and do all in one night. So make sure you come out for that Friday, August 11th, and get connected with that ministry anyway. They do fantastic work. And if you get on your e- their email list, like I am, you're constantly in the know of just what's happening um, and what you can do um, even just this week to make a difference. So that's that. Also today, before you go to the beach, if you're like me, you have plans to go to this place called Refuge um, because I get to help out with this class today. So if you are new and you want to know more about Refuge and what we're all about here, this is a free class. that includes lunch. Happen to know the menu today. It's pizza, in case you wanted to know. Um, And we have plenty of space, actually, for today's class. So if you want to sign up even now online or just show up, Um, It's at 1 o'clock today in our cafe. We take you on a tour of the building. And this is also a prerequisite to serve at Refuge. And if after today's message where you hear about what it looks like to be part of a ministry team, you're all the more encouraged and emboldened to do that, um, you might be interested in taking that class. We offer it once a month. Next. Um, you were so eager back there to, to, to advance that slide for the barbecue. I understand. That looks super appealing. Um, and Pastor Shaddy told me, just, you know, let them know it's probably not going to look like that. <laughs> and I said, you mean it's going to look better? Because I know you guys and the guys who do barbecue here, you, you do it well. So um, this is happening Thursday, August 17th, and it's an opportunity if you've never attended a men's, attended a men's event here or gotten connected with the guys here at Refuge. We have some really cool guys here, so I encourage you to do that. And um, it's all free, so free fellowship. There's going to be another um, men's event that's going to be mentioned soon you're going to want to take advantage of as well. Lastly, um, as you walked in, you probably saw a table for this ministry. It's called Dance for Joy. It's not a refuge ministry, but it's a refuge-adjacent, we love them ministry. Several kids um, here at Refuge are part of it. It's a nonprofit. They never turn anyone away who wants to dance for joy and be part of weekly dance classes. And so they're putting on this gala to help support the scholarships. Um, for those kids. And I say kids because it's mostly kids, but I asked them, and they said, let me write this down. Yeah, I did. They said, we have someone as old as 79 in our dance program. So it's for adults too, and they have two locations, one in Costa Mesa, one in Irvine. And you can find out more about their ministry and get tickets for the gala. It sounds like it's going to be a very cool event um, at the table um, today or on their website. I think that is everything on my list. So why don't we go ahead and stand together and um, maybe do a little dance while you're introducing your, no, wow, okay, that's fine. Just introduce yourselves, that's fine. Good morning, Refuge. Good morning, good morning, good morning. So good to see you guys. Glad you're here this morning. Um, Just two quick things. Baptism, just get there early. You guys know what's going on down there. It's chaos. It's craziness. But it's going to be worth you showing up. And we've told our baptizees, people getting baptized, baptizees, um, hey, just get there early because we're starting at 5 o'clock. Uh, it, I imagine there's going to be some parking issues, uh, so just get down there early uh, so that we can start at 5 o'clock. We'd love to have you there at 5 o'clock rooting them on. Um, we have so many great pictures from last year of just the Refuge family, y'all. Even though you weren't getting baptized, you were down there on the beach shore celebrating, so we want to do that again this year, and we understand completely that it, there's a traffic issue down there, so just get 
get there early. Uh, be ready to be patient. We'll be patient. It'll be a beautiful night. Uh, we'll go all the way into the sunset, and we'll do some hot dogs and s'mores, but just get down there the best way you possibly can. Uh, maybe ride your bikes, you know, park someplace far off and ride your bike there. Um, second thing is this, August 26, men, August 26, every year we do this uh, conference called the Pursuit Conference. Typically, in the past, we've invited other churches to come, guest speakers to come from outside in, and this year we're doing something a little different. We thought it would be a great opportunity for us just to speak to what does it mean to be a man of refuge. Uh, and so we want to speak directly to the men of refuge. So we're going to have speakers from in-house. I, there's this guy, his name is Pastor Bill, uh, who's going to lead us in worship. And so we're going to have in-house speakers. We're going to talk about things that, what does it look like to be a, a man of refuge? So that's August 26th. So I, men, slow down. Come on, don't write it all down at one time. August 26th. I see more women writing down August 26th <laughs> than men. Honey, you're going to this August 26th. Uh, it'll probably be from 8 to about 1. So 8 to 1. And we've got some special things planned for that day. But August 26th is the date that you want to write down. And we'll tell you more as that gets closer. You ready to dive in this morning? Yeah. All right, let's pray. Lord, thank you uh, for this sweet time of worship. Uh, thank you for the team that's come to lead us and prepare our hearts uh, for your word. Lord, you are truly amazing. Uh, Lord, if we just were to take a moment and ponder all the things that we love about you, uh, we could go on and on in your grace and your mercy and, and the, the joy that you fill us with, the truth of salvation. Lord, we could go on, but Lord, we want to just talk for a moment and, and just look at your word. Open your word this morning and see what you have for us. Lord, that's why we come to this place. We want to hear what you have. Lord, we don't want to leave in the same place that we came. Lord, we want to come leave this place knowing you more and, and knowing who we are more in light of who you are. And so, Lord, would you do that this morning in this place by your spirit and through your word. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Um, one of the greatest things about the church, I, I would say this church, I know there's other churches, uh, but I'm around this one a lot. So one of the greatest things about this church uh, is the way y'all love each other and, and the way that you serve each other. In fact, even this morning, uh, as I walk in, uh, and this happens every Sunday morning, uh, Al at the front, who's handing out verse cards, he, he gives me three verse cards. You know why? Because throughout the morning, I lose them. So he's learned over time. <laughs> I need to give Jeff three verse cards. And let me just tell you, it's, it's a blessing. There's, there's a certain element of family relationship that happens in that moment where, where, where we get to know each other so much of like, hey, that guy needs three verse cards. I know him. I know a little bit about him. There's a special moment when you begin to join a church, you become part of the family, you get to know each other's names. You get to know each other's highs and lows. It's not just a, hey, dude, what's up? Hey, brother, and then you walk on. But actually, there's, there's community that starts to happen within a church. Here's the other thing that's cool. When you come to this place and you join this family and you get the smiles and you get the, how are you doing, you, you also know you join a church that has a common purpose, uh, that we're all about Jesus and we're all about sharing the gospel. That, that you know that when you join the Refuge family, that actually we're more than just about what happens here on a Sunday morning, that actually we take the gospel throughout the week to our workplaces and to our families, that you join that sort of team, that actually we all have a common purpose with each other, which is to share the love of Christ with other people. That's such an awesome part of what ministry is all about. In fact, on the tough days, I'll just tell you every once in a while, those happen in ministry. When you're a volunteer ministry leader, or when you're a volunteer on a Sunday morning, or a, a Thursday lunch and a prayer, or when you're a pastor, there are tough ministry days, and, and, and the grace of God is so good, his mercy towards us is so good, the love of, of the word of God is so good, but there's also something that comes along with that. It, it's the community that you're a part of as the family of Christ, as the body of Christ, as the word says. And you join that, and you become a part of that. And so on those weekdays, you, you only have to come to this place, and Al gives you three cards, and he says, hey, I love you, and here's three, here's three verse cards for you. And you're like, I'm known. 
<laughs> they know me here, right? I'm part of, of this family. And I'll just tell you, uh, maybe this morning is, is a call for you to, to come back out of the woodwork and step into the house of God again and begin to serve and be known in the house of God. Maybe God this morning is drawing you out and saying, I want you to be a part of a family again. And quite frankly, if I could just be honest with you, I think this is an amazing family. It's an incredible family. But maybe you don't live here. You live someplace else and maybe God's calling you to a different church, a different place, but I would just encourage you, exhort you to plug in somewhere. Begin to serve, begin to get to know people's names. And, and in some ways this morning, as we look at our text, we're going to see three people who get plugged in. We're going to see, we get to know three people that join the, the grace ministry team, Paul's ministry team. And so as we go through our time this morning, we're going to look at three different people. So if you're a note taker, you just write three, one, two, three, and you'll know where we are the whole entire time. So, so I want you to see that. If you would, turn with me to Acts chapter 16 in the Bible. Acts chapter 16, Acts chapter 16. And as you turn there, let me catch you up to speed of where we've been. Paul has just gotten done with ministry, uh, uh, mission number one, journey number one. And he had the whole Jerusalem council. You remember that? And they were debating over a certain issue. Do you remember what the issue was that they were debating? Somebody help me. Circumcision. circumcision to circumcise or not to circumcise, right? That was the debate. Are we saved by following the Mosaic law and being circumcised plus Jesus, or is Jesus enough? And we talked about this a couple of weeks ago, and there was this big debate on the house floor, and they were going back and forth with each other to the culmination of this. This was the decision. What is it? Do you know? Jesus is enough right? They came to the conclusion that based on the pouring out of the Spirit, God working his miracles amongst the people and people's lives changing and being saved, it, it, Jesus was enough. And this actually is where Paul taught that. And if you look at the missionary journeys of Paul, somebody help me, how many missionary journeys did Paul take? I see four. I hear three. So three missionary journeys. The fourth one is his trip to Rome, which I would definitely consider that a missionary journey. Uh, he goes all the way to Rome, and he's in prison there, and that was a missionary journey. But here are his first two. I want to help you through this. I think this is critical for us to understand when we want to look at Scripture. Here we are. Look here. This is where it starts in Antioch. And, and actually, in missionary journey number one, he goes down here along this blue line. You see him traveling up. He goes all the way over here to Derby, And then the orange line is him going all the way back down to Antioch. Again, that was missionary journey number one. And Paul comes back on fire for the Lord. And Barnabas is with him. And they're like, you'll never believe what we saw God do as we preached to Gentiles. God poured his spirit out on them, and God did miracles. And that's kind of where the whole confusion came. Well, do they need to be, or do they need to be circumcised in order to be saved, or is Jesus enough? And Paul and Barnabas are like, all we did was preach Jesus, and people's lives were changed. So that's the council then meets down here in Jerusalem, and they decide, you know what? Jesus is enough. Go preach that. Second missionary journey then in, is, starts right here in Antioch, and we see this purple line, and it starts to move all the way out, back around, across into Macedonia, down into Achaia. Right now we come back, we're coming back down here, make a stop out here in Jerusalem, go all the way back up to Antioch. That's missionary journey number two. Now here's what I think is so cool. When you are reading Scripture... As you look at the letters of Paul, do you know who Paul was writing to? Many of these churches whom he visited in, on these journeys that he was on. So when we see scripture and we see Philippians, oh, he stopped at a city called Philippi. When we see Ephesians, oh, he stopped and at at, at started a church here in Ephesus. There's these letters that Paul is writing to churches where he had built relationship and cared so deeply for them. And oftentimes in these letters, you would see him correct people or exhort people or encourage people, stay true to the faith. And those were all churches that he met people on his missionary 
journeys. Now, this morning we're going to meet three people he met on these missionary journeys. Now, the purpose of journey number two, we see in Acts chapter 15. You're in 16. I'll show it up here for you. Acts chapter 15. Here's the purpose of this journey. Here it is. Then after some days, Paul said to Barnabas, let us now go back and visit our brethren in every city where we have preached the word of the Lord and see how they are doing, right? We preach the word, we've planted the seeds. Paul is gonna plant seeds, Barnabas is gonna water seeds. Let's go back and check and see how people are doing. Are those seeds growing? Is the church healthy in those areas? Look at Acts 15, 41. And he went through Syria and Cilicia, strengthening the churches. What's the purpose of missionary journey number two? Somebody help me. Encourage, strengthen, check and see the health of the churches. Now, they're going to start more churches, by the way, on that journey. But they're going to get the help of our first friend here that we're going to see, number one. Look at Acts chapter 16, verse 1. Acts chapter 16, verse 1. Here's what it says. Then he came to Derbe and Lystra, and behold, a certain disciple was there named Timothy, the son of a certain Jewish woman who believed. But his father was Greek. He was well spoken of by the brethren who were at Lystra and Iconium. Now, here's something that's so interesting to look at. He's meeting this young man by the name of of Timothy. and, And I believe probably either he knew who Timothy was already uh, because Timothy, we know, is a what? What does it say in here in the text? He's a disciple. So he's already given his life to the Lord. Now, how did that happen? If Paul is coming to Lystra, which, by the way, is right here where the red circle is. You can kind of see it. Here's Derby, and here's Lystra. He's left Antioch. He's on this second missionary journey, and here he is in this region, and he meets this young Timothy. Now, has Paul been to Lystra before? Yes, he has. Acts chapter 14, actually. Remember this? Paul heals this man, and the people of Lystra freak out, and what do they say? They're gods. And what specifically, somebody help me, who are the two gods that they believe them, he and Barnabas to be? Zeus and Hermes. That's right. Good job, Bible students, right? And they want to worship him, to which Paul and Barnabas say, we're just men, just like you. In that moment, the Jews come in, and it says they stirred up the people. And what do they do to Paul? They stone him, that's right. There's a throwing motion right there. They stone him to the point of death even. And and so then what happens? Paul doesn't die, right? There's this miraculous moment where how could you not die with those people throwing so many rocks at you? What does Paul do then? He gets up. He goes where? Back into the city. It was incredible. Like we would have been like, nah, I'm not going back into the city. I'm going on. There's another venture out there for me. But Paul actually goes back into the city. The Bible doesn't tell us what he does when he goes back into the city. But my guess is that he goes to meet with those people whom he had raised up in Jesus' name, that he had spent time with. And maybe, maybe Timothy and his family are some of those people. Maybe it was just to tell him, hey, I'm not dead because you thought I was dead. I got hit so many times, but actually, I'm not dead. And actually, in that moment, he's been to Lystra. He's preached the gospel. Maybe he's going to see Timothy and Timothy's family. Here's what we actually find out about Timothy is that he's actually been closely discipled by Paul, or he will be closely discipled by Paul. It will be one of the joys of Timothy's life and one of the joys of Paul's life to be discipling together. Here's what we know. Look, in fact, what Paul calls Timothy here in 2 Timothy 3.10. Oh, sorry, 1 Timothy 1.2. says this, To Timothy, a true son in the faith. Think about that. The relationship between this young man that we're meeting for the first time this morning, who's going to join the ministry team, their relationship gets so tight that Paul actually says, you are my true son in the faith. Look at this, 1 Corinthians 4.15, for, through, for though you might, Paul writing to the church of Corinth, he says, for though you might have 10,000 instructors in Christ, yet you do not have many fathers. 
For in Christ I have begotten you through the gospel. Therefore I urge you, imitate me. And he says, for this reason I have sent Timothy to you, who is my beloved and faithful, somebody help me, son in the Lord. In other words, I can't be there. I'm sending Timothy to you. He is equal to being my son. If you want to learn to imitate me, watch my son in the faith, Timothy. There's this tight relationship. One more. Philippians 2.20, for I have no one like-minded who will sincerely care for your state, for all seek their own, not the things which are of Christ Jesus, but you know this, and you know his proven character, that as a son with his father, he served me in the gospel, speaking of Timothy. There's this sense that this is the start of a relationship that will be so close within the church bounds. In the ministry, as they they go out together and they learn about each other and they grow in the faith so much so that Paul will rely on Timothy to pastor churches. He will care for people. And I will just tell you, that's one of the beauties of the church, is that I don't know what kind of home or background you come from, but when you join this church, you can be discipled through love of the name of Christ, and you will grow to have family members here that you meet with on a Sunday morning. Maybe there's older men in the faith or younger men that you disciple in the faith. Older women in the faith or younger women in the faith who you disciple. That's one of the beauties of the body of Christ, and we see it right here with Paul. As he says, this is my son in the faith. We're getting to see the very beginning of that moment that started off as Paul rolls into Lystra. And here's this young man. He's like, hey, this, this is a guy. I, I'm gonna, I think God's going to use this guy. And he's going to use me in his life. And, and by the way, if I could just for a moment just tell you that, that as we meet on August 26th, as we talk about what does it mean to be a man of refuge, that's one of our topics. It, is what, the stage of life that God has me in, Right now, am I mentoring or am, am I being mentored? Am I growing in my walk with the Lord? Am I helping other young men grow in their walk with the Lord? That will be one of our topics that day. And I believe that was what Paul saw. Paul probably discipled many people, but there was something special for him in discipling Timothy. Here's something else that we learn about Timothy. He had a strong, godly mom. He had a strong and godly Mom, if you would, look at verse 1 again. It says, he's the son of a certain Jewish woman who believed. And what she believed was in Jesus, in the grace of God, and the love of Christ. The son of a certain Jewish woman who believed, but his father was Greek. Now, there's an interesting statement there. He had a Jewish mom and a dad who was Greek. So what the idea here is that he gets his faith through who? His strong mom. And actually, we don't know what happens with his dad. It said he was Greek, whether that meant he was out of the picture or he had passed away. But we do know that Timothy grew up with an understanding of the scriptures. And how do we know that? Take a look at this text, 2 Timothy 3.15. Speaking of Timothy, Paul writing to him, and that from childhood you have known the holy scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. So Paul, writing to Timothy, says, you've known the scriptures from your childhood. Now, who did he get that from? Mom who was in the faith or dad who was Greek? Probably mom who was in the faith, right? Who was walking with the Lord and knew the scriptures. Check this one out. 2 Timothy 1.5, when I call to remembrance the genuine faith that is in you, Timothy, which dwelt first in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and I am persuaded is in you also. Therefore, I remind you to stir up the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of my hands. Upon, you know, Paul laying his hands upon Timothy for ministry. For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of sound mind. So he gets this faith from a strong grandma and a strong mom. That actually one of the strengths in Timothy's life has been the female relationship that he's had in his, in his home. And, and I know some of you have that, right? How many of you have strong moms and strong grandmas that, that prayed you into faith, 
right? Some of you are like, strong mom, very strong mom, right? That actually helped disciple you into the faith. And that some of you would say, I have a strong faith because of my mom. I grew up in a, an, an only mom household, right? No dad in the picture. And my mom made sure that I was at church every Sunday from when I was even just little. That she made sure I went to that school in, up in Whittier, Trinity Lutheran, to make sure to lay a foundation of faith and, and Bible, right? That I had a strong mom and a grandma, by the way, who would pray for me as well. Some of us come from those homes that have strong mom backgrounds. That's what Timothy came from. The third thing we learn here in our text is that he's well-respected in the community. Look at verse 2. He was well-spoken of by the brethren who were at Lystra and Iconium. And even at this young age, as as Paul gets uh, to Timothy, he looks at him. He says, hey, this young man, he he can walk into the neighborhood and people respect him, even at a young age. Well respected. In other words, he hadn't burned any bridges with people. That Paul's thinking, maybe this kid could be good for ministry. And and I really would like to use him. And look at this. As I look back, he's like what, what the Bible would call somewhat of an elder. He's well respected by the people inside of his community. I, I want that on my ministry team. That's, that's who I want. People who, who, who love and, and respect this person so that they could be ministry partners with us. And so here in this moment, look what it says. It just says he's well respected within the community. Now, look at verse 3. This has ca- caused lots of people to scratch their heads. Uh, hopefully we'll put that to rest this morning. Look what it says in verse 3. Paul wanted to have him go with him. Go with him where? Somebody help me. On which journey? Second ministry journey. All right, good, right? I want him to go with us. I want to take Timothy with us on this journey. And he took him and what? Circumcised him because of the Jews who were in that region, for they all knew that his father was Greek. What? I mean, we just spent two weeks talking about how unimportant it is that someone is circumcised, right? That you're not saved through circumcision, that you're actually saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. And not of any type of works like circumcision or Mosaic law, but by God's grace. Now, what are you doing, Paul? Like, why would you do that to Timothy? It seems like You've taken a step back, taken a step back. Imagine the, the, the conversations that would have been going on. I knew by the Jews first would it be, I knew Paul would come back to reality, right? All this whole saved by grace through faith. I knew he'd finally take hold of his Jewish roots again, start the idea of circumcision, and come back to the Mosaic law for salvation. I knew Paul would do it. On the other side, they would be scratching their heads thinking, the, the, you know, the, the Christians of the day would be saying, what? We went through the whole Jewish council. I, I remember when Peter stood up and he, he talked about how we were saved by grace through faith. And, and I thought Paul was on our team. I thought Paul would certainly have held to these truths and these realities. And in, in this moment, he goes and he circumcises Timothy. Now, why did he do it? Why would he have he'd crossed that boundary? Why make that such a big decision? I think it says it right here in the text. The first, look at verse 3. Paul wanted to have him go with him. So that's the first. I see this young man who's ready to go into ministry, and, and I want him to go on the, the second journey with us. And, and actually, I want him to be able to preach and teach it on the second missionary journey. And so if, if it was like, hey, you're going to stay at home, we're leaving, I don't think he circumcises him, right? But I want you to go with me. So that's part of it. I want you to be on this ministry team. Now, look what it says. And he took him and circumcised him. Why? What's the word there? Because of the Jews who were in that region, for they all knew that his father was Greek. In other words, they knew Timothy was part Jewish, but they also know his dad was Greek. He wasn't circumcised, which would then prevent him from going into synagogues and teaching. It would, it would prevent him from having be able to preach and teach to Jew, Jewish men at all. 
that actually one of the barriers for him to be able to cross over and enter into preaching the gospel would have been the fact that he wasn't circumcised. It, he, they would have shut the door as soon as he walked into the synagogue. No, man, you get out of here. You, you're, a, you're a traitor, right? Your dad was, was a Greek, right? Yeah, we know you're Jewish mom, but you, you're not circumcised, and your dad was a Greek, so not in here. You, you can't even enter in. The conversation then becomes this. What's more important? P- Timothy, as he comes on this second missionary journey, being able to go into synagogues, which, by the way, is where they would start in most towns. If there was a synagogue, they would start in the synagogue and begin to teach the gospel there. And then it would spread out to the Gentiles. So Timothy wouldn't even be able to go into those synagogues. And he would certainly have had to debate with people about why he's not circumcised. So I believe what Paul is saying here is, Timothy, let's get rid of that whole debate. You get circumcised, and let's go preach the gospel to Jews and to Gentiles. When we go into those cities, we're going to erase the whole confusion and the barrier and all the arguments we're going to have to make of why he was and why he wasn't, and why the Jerusalem Council and all this. Let's get rid of all that, and you just go in and preach the gospel. And so I think what he does here is is he's removing this barrier that Timothy would have had because he was not circumcised. Now, I want you to see this. 1 Corinthians 9.19, Paul understands this. Paul understands this completely. In fact, this is what he writes to the church at Corinth. He says, "For for though I am free from all men, I have made myself a servant to all. Timothy, this is a challenge. Are, are you willing to make yourself a servant to all? I know this is controversial. I know this is a big decision. I know there's going to be backlash. But listen, we're going to do it for the gospel. This circumcision will be so that you can enter in and preach the gospel to people. Will you be willing at the very onset of leaving your home and going with us on this missionary journey to be a servant to all? That I might win the more, Paul says, And to the Jews, I became as a Jew, that I might win the Jews. To those who are under the law, as under the law, that I might win those who are under the law. Do you see it? Timothy, are you willing to become like the Jews in order to win those people who are still stuck under the law? And yet, you're the stronger brother, Timothy. They're the weaker brother. Will you be willing to reach down in this way and minister to the weaker brother even in this moment? Look what he says. To those who are without law, as without the law, not being without the law toward God, but under the law toward Christ, that I might win those who are without law. To the weak, I became as weak, I might, so that I might win the weak. I've become all things to all men, that I might be what? That I might by all means save how many? Some. Even just some, not even all. But I would do whatever it takes. I would become all things to all people, even just to win some. Timothy, would you be willing to walk through circumcision, even if it was to mean just to to win some of those Jews who you're going to preach to? Would you be willing to do that just to win some? Now this I do for the gospel's sake, that I may be partaker of it with you. Now, could Timothy have said, no way, Paul. (laughs) <laughs> no. I mean, we've just been through all this Jerusalem council stuff. You've been preaching. I don't need to, we don't need to be circumcised. And now in this moment, before we go on this missionary journey, you want me to get circumcised? I don't think so. I have a right not to be circumcised. And I think Paul in that moment would have said, you're right. You totally have a right. But let me just tell you this. There are going to be closed doors if you hold on to that right. They will not hear you. They will not listen. I get it, Timothy. You're the stronger brother. You understand the idea of grace. And so what is circumcision? It's a door in to have a conversation with those unsaved Jews who are still holding on to the Mosaic law. Let me ask you this. Would you be willing to give up that right in order to reach just some? Paul says, I've become all things to all people. To the weak, I became weak just to even have a conversation with them about the gospel. What rights do we hold on to? And do we say, well, I'm not going to do that. I don't have to do that. I don't have to. We'll see that later on in food rights, right? Well, I should be able to eat whatever kind of food I want to eat. 
Well, well, the weaker brother doesn't understand that. Would you be willing to give up your food right in order to preach the gospel to the weaker brother, that gospel of grace and love? What rights are we holding on to that we would say, listen, maybe, maybe God would call me to say, I'm going to give up this one right in order to preach the gospel to someone in love and grace and mercy. Here's the fourth thing we learned about Timothy. Humble and passionate for people getting saved. Humble, I'll give up my right. Lord, I want to serve just like Paul serves, like my father in the faith. I see him as an example. I want to serve like him. And I'm passionate, like he is, to go to all the people and preach the gospel. Now, we're going to move on. Uh, and that is the longest person that we're going to talk about. So the other two were much shorter, much shorter. So if you're on one and you're like, oh my gosh, we're only on one. <laughs> Relax. You're okay. You're okay. We're going to keep moving here. Take a look at verse four. And as they went through the cities, they delivered to them decrees to keep, which were determined by the apostles and the elders at Jerusalem. That's the Jerusalem council that we've been talking about. Verse 5. So the churches were strengthened in the faith and increased in number daily. Here's why I think that's important. What was the message that the Jerusalem council came up with? It was two things. It was Paul, Barnabas, missionary team, go out, and I want you to preach the gospel of grace and love. And it's by faith you are saved, right? That's the message of the Jerusalem Council, not by works. In fact, I need you to go back and correct all those people who were going out preaching a works-based salvation. That's message number one. Message number two, if you remember, they said, but also tell them be careful what they eat, be careful of sexual immorality. As they go into these places and they preach the gospel, be careful, Tell the Gentiles that there's some things that they need to be mindful of. Do you remember why they had to be mindful of those things? For the, for the weaker brother, for the Jewish brother who was still holding on to those rules and laws, who would have thought, oh my gosh, I don't know if I can follow this. And he's saying, I want the Gentile brother, for the sake of unity, to love their Jewish brother by foregoing some of their rights, not for salvation, but in order that there would be unity amongst the church. And do you know, as we look at Paul's letters, as he writes to those churches, so much of it was unity, right? Hold together, people, hold together, right? And so here in this moment, what we see is, hey, go out, preach grace, preach unity. Now, what happens to those churches as grace and unity abound? Look at verse 5 again with me. So the churches were, what? strengthened in the faith, and what else? Increased in number daily. What do you think, I'm just saying, what do you think would be so beneficial for the church today? If we preached grace, right? If we preached that Jesus is the only way and it's by faith in him that we are saved, if that's our message, and if we demonstrated to the world around us what the first century church was demonstrating, which is even amongst differences, there's unity. And I believe what happens in those churches is that they will be strengthened. You as a believer, as a follower of Christ, will be strengthened. And people will say, dang, they're amazing. You, I can't even believe what they have at that place. When I walk in, it feels like a family. It feels different. And what is that that they're feeling? The love of Christ building the unity of the body of Christ. And it says that they increased in number. Now, I want you to see this. Verse 6. Now when they had gone through Phrygia and the region of Galatia, they were forbidden by the Holy Spirit to preach the word in Asia. What? That's bizarre to me, right? Let's just think about that for a second. They were forbidden by the Holy Spirit to preach the word in Asia. Now, how often do you hear that the Holy Spirit forbids us to preach the word? Not very often. In fact, what do we usually say? It was the enemy that was forbidding us to preach the word, to go down to the pier with the evangelism team, and people come against us. Oh, that's the enemy. But in this particular case, what do we see? It's very clearly the Holy Spirit preventing them from preaching the word in Asia. Here's a map up here. I want you to see this. So they're here in Derby and Lystra and Iconium, and they're moving up on this missionary journey. 
And they want to go down into here where these churches will eventually become uh, churches. They will be down there. In fact, do you know something about those churches? Do you recognize something from a book of the Bible? Revelation, right? Those are some of the churches of Revelation. So they want to get down in here to Asia. And it says the Holy Spirit prevented them from going there, stopped them from going there. So then, what's your natural thought? Okay, Lord, you don't want us to go into Asia. Maybe you're calling us to then go north. Look at verse 7. After they had come to Mysia, they tried to go to Bithynia, but the Spirit did not permit them. So passing by Mysia, they came to Troas. So look at, oh, we can't go here. Let's go up into this region of Bithynia. The Holy Spirit says, no, 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 no. That's not where I have you going. Okay, Lord, well, we'll keep walking. So they end up keep on walking to Troas, which then what's the problem there? Where else do you want us to go? <laughs> there, the next step is the, is the sea. It's, it's the water. I, there's no place else for us to go, which at this moment, if you're Paul and you're Timothy and Silas and you're the missionary team that's supposed to be sharing the gospel, and you've had success because we just read that the church was growing daily because of the grace of God and the unity. God, we want to share it. Where do we go? And you can imagine there were probably levels of frustration as they couldn't get into Asia and they couldn't get into Bithynia. God, what would you have us do? And, and maybe some would think, well, let's turn back and let's just stop this whole thing. Or let's get frustrated at God, right? It's probably his fault. Well, God, why aren't you answering these, these answers to the, to the question that we want to serve? And you're closing these doors, and God, I'm a little frustrated at you right now, right? Where are you in all this? And haven't we all been there in that moment where the doors are all closed, and we're like, ah, like I just, I honestly want to honor you, but I don't see where we're supposed to go. I'm standing at the edge of the sea with no place to go, to then asking the question, God, I've stopped I'm listening. You, there's no place else for us to go. So, so we'll wait here and, until you answer, until you give us the answer of what you want us to do. And sometimes God does that, doesn't he? He just stops us, humbles us, sometimes breaks us. And, and we've tried everything, and we've thought here and there and here and there, and it's all been stopped. And then God, in that moment, he, he'll speak to us. He'll give us clarity on purpose, either through his word, through a brother and sister in the Lord, sometimes through a vision or a dream. He'll say, this is where I want you to go. Here's where I want you to be. And isn't that what we all want? I, I believe with all my heart that we can go through a lot of things. We can walk through a lot of things as long as we know that we are honoring God in our lives, as long as we know this is where he wants us to be. In fact, I feel like when you're on the missionary field and speaking with our missionaries, there's sometimes, there, it's just that that holds them there. That, that when you're in another country, away from your home, away from your family, the only thing that sometimes keeps you there is the call that God put upon your life. And, and, and in that moment, all they have to rely on is that we're standing at the edge of the sea and things are not going well and we've been stopped in all these places. Maybe we'll just quit. Maybe we'll just get home. And maybe I'm just a little frustrated at the Lord. And then they remember that passage. They go back to the passage. They go back to that dream, that vision. They give back to that conversation they had with the brother or sister of the Lord that put them onto that mission field. And that's the thing that holds them. Here's the thing that held Paul, I think, so tightly. Look at verse 9. And a vision appeared to Paul in the night. A man of Macedonia stood and pleaded with him, saying, Come over to Macedonia and help us. Now, after he had seen the vision, immediately we sought to go to Macedonia, concluding that the Lord had called us to preach the gospel to them. In this moment, I want you to see this. He could have been frustrated. He could have been all of these things. And yet in this moment, clarity. Oh, that's why those doors had been closed. That's why we weren't able to go into Asia or Bithynia. That's why we're standing at the edge and nowhere else to go. Because God had a purpose and a plan, but it took us waiting and being patient and praying and listening. And then he gets this vision from Macedonia of a man. Now, when I read this text, just being truthful, I always think of this moment uh, from Star Wars. 
where, now it's, to me it's Star Wars 1, I understand it's Star Wars 4, but it was the first one I saw, so that's the one I always put it in, one, I understand, for Star Wars, people who love Star Wars. I know it's 4, but in this moment, if you remember it from the movie, Princess Leia is, make, has a message for Obi-Wan Kenobi, and here's what she says. She says something like this, she says, Obi-Wan Kenobi, please help, you're, our, you're my only hope. And, and in this minute, I, just, I see the man from Macedonia leaning down and saying, Paul, come to us. You're our only hope. Like, every time I read this, I'm like, that is, that is that's Leah. I'm sure Lucas got this from Scripture. Uh, in, that, in that moment, it's like, here's the man from Macedonia, and he's saying, listen, come to us. You are our only hope. In fact, his direct words are, come over to Macedonia and help us. Now, Here's what I've done here. I've snuck in our second person. Did you guys see it? Did you guys see the second person that came in here? Listen to what is said here because there's a second person is Dr. Luke. Dr. Luke who's actually writing Acts. And here's what many people believe. They join, he joins the ministry team, the grace team, right here. Look at verse 10. It says, Now after, they, after he had seen the vision, immediately what? We sought to go to Macedonia. Up until this point, it was they and they and they. And at this moment, he says, we went over to Macedonia. Many believe that Dr. Luke joins the Paul ministry team at this point. In fact, more than likely what happens is there's a bond that grows between them as well as they do ministry together. In fact, there's a moment in Colossians where he says, uh, he calls Luke the beloved physician. He's the beloved physician. Uh, he also, you know, we know that he, he's, he writes Acts. Do you know what other uh, book that Luke writes? You, it was too obvious, wasn't it? Luke, the gospel of Luke. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. I mean, we're meeting him as he joins the ministry team right here. That's pretty incredible that he's actually a gospel writer. In fact, he's the only Gentile that writes one of the New Testament books. So Luke isn't Jewish by nature. He's a Gentile, and here he is writing one of the Gospels. Now, I think he would grow on, grow with Paul. In fact, we know this because when Paul goes to Rome in the final days, he's imprisoned, and you know who's with him? Luke is with him. Dr. Luke is with him. And so there's this incredible bond, I believe, in this moment, even though it was a blip on our map, where this second person joins this ministry team, and then they move on. Now, here I'll throw the map up here while we read this to their journey. This is verse 11. Therefore, sailing from Troas, we ran straight course to Samothrace, and the next day came to Neapolis. And from there to Philippi, which is the foremost city of the part of Macedonia, a colony. And we were staying in that city for some days. Take a look at this. Here's where they are. They were in Troas. They've moved to Samothrace and then Neapolis. And now here they are in Philippi. What we know about Philippi is it's one of the major cities in the region. Probably high-level Roman. There, some people even believe there was a, a, a Roman base there. So lots of Romans in that area, lots of uh, cultural influence by Rome, and yet standing out is our third person that we're going to meet here this morning. Look at verse 13. And on the Sabbath day, we went out of the city to the riverside, where prayer was customarily made. And we sat down and spoke to the women who met there. Now a certain woman named Lydia heard us. She was a seller of purple from the city of Thyatira. Who worshiped God. The Lord opened her heart to heed the things spoken by Paul, and when she had heard her when she and her household were baptized, she begged us, saying, If you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come to my house and stay. So she persuaded us. Now, here's our third person. She is from Thyatira. You can see it up here on our map. It's actually over here on the Asia side, which is so interesting to me. That God brings Lydia, who is, by the way, a worshiper of God, so which means she was probably Gentile, but she had given her life to Judaism and started worshiping God before she met Christ. So much so that she actually would go out every week to the riverside and they would pray together with this probably group of women. 
Now, the reason why she wasn't at a synagogue is for probably two reasons. One, either that Philippi was like, no synagogues here. <laughs> don't, I don't, we don't want that whole Jewish influence here in Philippi. Or they didn't have even 10 faithful Jewish men. That's what you needed to start a synagogue in that day. They probably didn't have 10 faithful Jewish men who would want to start the synagogue. So now these ladies take it upon themselves to go out to the riverside and be in prayer and worship of God. So when Paul, Timothy, Silas, ministry team comes in and they're there for a couple days, they're probably like, hey, where do people worship God around here? Yahweh. And they're like, the bunch of ladies out by the riverside, right? Go head out there. And they go out there and it says they taught them. It didn't say they preached to them. They actually taught them about who Jesus was. And Lydia stands up and it just takes with her. And this is where Lydia is from. Now, here's the amazing thing. Lydia's from Thyatira. Paul and the ministry team, some of them are from Antioch and along this journey. And it took God bringing them all over here to Philippi for this gospel experience to take place. For Jesus to permeate through Lydia's heart, this businesswoman, by the way, right? Doesn't mention anything about her husband. It says she was a businesswoman in the, in the color purple of dyes. And she, actually, that was one of the, the businesses of Thyatira that she had brought with her over to Philippi. And now she's there, and we know that she has a house because she's invited the ministry team to come back to the house and stay with her. She's probably got some means because she's ready to provide for these guests. So this woman is very resourceful. And you can imagine God's like, I'm going to use this woman. She's going to be someone who's going to be important within the church. And probably I'm going to bring her over here from Thyatira where I will take care of Asia. There will be churches there. I want her to be part of the church plant here in Philippi. And I'm going to move her over there by any means. And then I'm going to bring Paul and the ministry team. And she is going to be a huge, make a huge impact for the church in Philippi. In fact, there's a pivotal moment here. Look at verse 14 with me. It says this. What does it say? The Lord opened her heart to heed the things spoken. Listen to that. The Lord opened her heart. It wasn't necessarily Paul's great wording of how to believe in Jesus. It wasn't necessarily the ministry team's love and connection and unity, but it was actually God who says, I want to use this woman within the church. She's going to be a powerful part of this church, and I'm going to open her heart, that God actually opens her heart to the reality of who Jesus is. Her response then is what? Somebody help me. What does she do with her household? She opens her household, but what does she do before that even? She gets baptized. She says, listen, I'm all the way in on Jesus. My household, we're all the way in on Jesus. This is a changing moment for our lives. Lydia's life is forever changed, just like this, uh, tonight when we go down to the beach and there's 35 people who want to get baptized. They've already made that commitment to follow Christ. This is the outward sign of saying, as for me and my house, we're going to follow the Lord. I'm all the way in on Jesus. I'm going to follow him forever. And I don't know what the circumstances what brought all 35 of those people to know Jesus, but I can tell you this. It was a God moment is when God opened their hearts to receive him. It's when God sends along the ministry team, whoever that is. Maybe it was a mom or a grandma. Maybe it was someone here at Refuge, or maybe it was somebody at work. God orchestrated the path for them to hear that gospel message, and now their response is, I'm all the way in. I'm going to follow him forever. Lydia, I believe, becomes part of the church uh, and the movement forward of the gospel as she opens her home. Here's the thing. Timothy, Luke, Lydia, all three of the people that we met this morning that joined the ministry team, radically different, right? Young man, probably a little older man, doctor, uh, woman, in, uh, live, a, gent a Gentile woman living in Philippi who's from Asia, different backgrounds completely. But here's the cool thing. At some point, they probably all sat together. They all knew who each other were. And they all started talking about what Jesus had done in their life. And there's immediately this, I just believe there's this connection that takes place where they're starting to share. And Paul's saying, listen, God is going to use all three of you 
in powerful ways, in different ways, in powerful ways. And I believe the same thing is true of, of you, that there's the moment where you gave your life to the Lord and God says, listen, I want you to join a ministry team. I want you to go plug yourself into a church, the family of God, the body of Christ. And I want you to teach grace and mercy and, and God's love. And I want you to fight for unity. I don't want disunity within the body of Christ, unity within the body of Christ. I want you to fight for it. And, and then here's what's going to happen. You're going to start to love those people that you see week in and week out as you serve side by side for the gospel with them. And just like the three that we met this morning, you begin to grow closer and closer together, so much so that, that we call ourselves a family. We're, we're a family who, who puts things down and helps others, who puts things down and helps each other, that we drop things and go, that we love each other, we care each other. We give each other three verse cards <laughs> in the morning because we learn little things about each other that will bless each other. And so my encouragement to you is if you, again, are, are sitting on the outskirts and you're saying, I don't know, I don't know, can I just exhort you and tell you that I believe one of the things God calls us to as followers of Christ is to plug into the body of Christ. With all of our weaknesses and shortcomings and crazy things that we do, God says, listen, I want you to be a part of this body and begin to grow in it. I hope this was a blessing this morning. I hope God moves you to that place of saying, I'm ready to jump in. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. God, I, I believe as we met these three, I, I think there's a reason why you called people to yourself. Lord, I believe number one for salvation, absolutely, that you love us, that you want to demonstrate that grace in us. But Lord, I also believe you want to, like you did with Timothy and Luke and Lydia, you want to demonstrate your grace through us as well, that actually we're conduits of your spirit to work in other people. Lord, I, I pray that you would just use us mightily and powerfully. Yes, individually, but also corporately as the body of Christ here at Refuge. That you would use us, the body of Christ, to reach the neighborhood, to reach the people around us. Lord, I pray for tonight as we go down to the beach and we testify by, by the reading of your word, by your spirit being present, and by these people making this public declaration of faith that other people would see that and think, what are they doing? And they would be drawn to follow after you. Lord, would you do that work every single day of the week here at Refuge and tonight at the beach? Lord, I believe t this morning you're calling some to, to jump in. Whatever hesitation, whatever has been holding them back for so long, I believe that you're asking them to jump in and ask, what, what do I need to do to plug in? Lord, if that's them this morning, I pray that you lead that very clear path to leading and serving in ministry. Lord, whatever that might look like to volunteer, whatever that might look like. Lord, maybe it's just even going to their work and saying, I'm going to be more active in my faith here at work or at school or in my family. Lord, lead them and guide them and strengthen. We pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Why don't we go ahead and stand up, church, as we sing this last song. Shower turn one more time. Transfixed on Jesus' face, He shall return. He shall return in robes of white. The blazing sun shall pierce the night, and I will rise among the saints. My Fixed on Jesus' face. Sing, oh, praise the name. Oh, praise the name of the Lord our God. Oh, praise His name forevermore. For endless days we will sing your
so much for worshiping with us. We'll see you guys next week. This has been a presentation of Refuge Calvary Chapel Huntington Beach. For more information about our ministry, please visit refugefamily.com or call 714-891-9495. Set free.